Hello and welcome and happy new year, everyone. Um, my name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Strategy Best Practices. It is the latest installment in the monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. And what a great topic to kick off our 12th year of the series. Can you believe it, Peter? It's our 12th year of doing this. I love it. Uh, just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. And to open the end, if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and we'll likewise send a link of the recording of the session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized manage data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. He has written dozens of articles and 12 books. And Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and is constantly named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his expertise. Peter has spent multi year immersions with groups as diverse as U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. And welcome to you, Shannon. And again, thank you for hosting this for 12 years uh, straight in through. It's just been wonderful to work with you and your team. And uh, I'll, I'll do another bit of praise on this as well while I throw up the fact that the books are on sale right at the moment, blah, blah, blah. But uh, we're really talking about here is the ability to bring topics that are of interest to you all and Shannon is the primary focus of that oh, so joining Peter? into this community yeah sure I'm gonna sorry I'm gonna interrupt you mm -hmm. we were good for a moment but now it went oh there it is it's just taking a moment to resolve mm. so the flames were too much for it right <laughs> yeah <laughs> We're good. Again, okay. <laughs> jump in if we get stuck. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's really been wonderful. And of course, that's our goal is, is to get as much of this stuff out there for you all as possible. So as you have suggestions how we can improve the process and everything else, um, by all means, uh, please do funnel them on in through Shannon or just reach out directly. Uh, she's the, the boss. I am the uh, talent, as they say, on this thing. Isn't that a great way to think about it? <laughs> I like being talented in some capacity, I suppose. Um, yeah, so the other place to start out here in the slide, as long as it's holding still, uh, is the Malcolm Gladwell quote in the upper right-hand corner. Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing that you do that makes you good. And that really is the sense of what we're talking about. So I'm also going to give you something that they do in the military called a bluff, which is the bottom line up front. It's kind of like when the flight attendant marches to the front of the plane and says, if uh, Charlotte, North Carolina wasn't in your travel plans, you're on the wrong plane, uh, tough luck staying in your seats at this point. And what we're talking about here is just the observation over the past 20 years. And I'm, by the way, coming to a little live on the video here is we've got the, the cameras sometimes fooled into thinking they can do something. But again, Shannon, let me know if it cuts out or anything. It is cutting out, so I would kill the video. Yeah, okay, we'll just kill that sucker then. Yeah. So. Sorry, <laughs> we're gonna, we'll make it work one way or another and y'all will get you make sure you have a copy of the slides as well to make sure you can can see all that. Well, and we had a, we're still recovering from that storm. Uh, we were without power for the whole of last week. So it was uh, probably not a lot of capacity in the in the session anyway. All right, well, anyway, um, pay no attention to the little person in the corner. So start out and say that trying to put together a complex strategy at the beginning of your data journey is generally not the best way to do it. It's, it's more along the lines of thinking instead that what you really should be doing is pulling a team together and improving your team capacity uh, all around data topics and things like that. Because and, and trying to figure out what that's going to be at first is very difficult because the first thing that you're going to do is to try to figure out what you need to fix, eliminate in your data debt. And when you eliminate that data debt, then you can build on top of it. But until you know what the debt looks like, it's really not a, a great way to do this. So instead of 
trying to come up with a perfect plan and following it to the end, which, you know, we can think back to when you were 18, how much did you know about what you were going to spend the rest of your life doing uh, at, at that perspective? It's just a very difficult process. And instead, put that same effort and passion and everything that you're doing into the process of building a team, practicing what I call strategic application of data concepts. We'll see how that works out in here and, and get better at that process. And that's really the, the main message on this. So let's get a little bit of context going. Uh, first of all, strategy is inherently a repetitive process that can be easily improved if you look at it from that perspective. Um, many of the, the branches of the military I work with, for example, revise their strategy uh, at least every once a decade in some cases. Um, but the idea is that they still have a group that does that and, and gets good at it, that there are some dependencies that exist. And, and primarily, the data strategy itself exists to support the organizational strategy. And at the, at the basis, most crude level, it's what can we use data to better help the organization succeed in its strategy to do uh, on that. That your, your process should evolve as it goes through, saying in particular that you're gonna start out and be rough, but you know, a couple of uh, cycles through the process, and there really is a, a nicely defined cycle uh, that gets you there, is much more important than the actual product. So when, when organizations come to me and say, hey, will you help us write a data strategy? I, I just wanna say, do you really know what it is you're going to do? Uh, what is that output going to be? Because in most cases with good data questions, the best outcome of many of these investigations is going to be another question. And that's always a challenge around that. 95% of the problems in our data space and therefore in data strategy as well are people and process challenges. And this is borne out year after year in research that, that continues to illustrate this. And yet we overemphasize the technology component, all of this. So how bottom line do we get to Carnegie Hall? The answer is practice, practice, practice. So let's go through the program uh, again over the remaining uh, 42 minutes, sorry, 52 minutes that we have. Uh, we'll talk about data strategy applied to data assets in that context. And then we will look at why data strategy and data governance are so interdependent. Then we'll move on and look at the prerequisites for implementing a data strategy. And that is the idea that there is this data debt that we need to eliminate or at least reduce substantially before we can really start to do the things we wanna do, which is the exploitation side of the data equation. Then what does that cyclical process look like in specific is the focus of the last portion on this. And of course we get to the Q and A session. So where we're gonna start here is looking specifically at what is a strategy. And many people are oftentimes put off by strategy because it seems complicated. And when it gets right down to the basics, your organization is going to do the same things your organization has done, but some things are going to be different. And, and that's really what we need to do is to provide the, motiva the motivation and the parameters for the change that's going to occur on this. There's a wonderful TED talk from Simon Sinek uh, called How Great Leaders Inspire Action. And I'll just summarize it here for you in a minute. Uh, human beings, we're pretty good at describing what it is that we do. We're less good at describing how we actually do that process. And we're quite frankly, not very good at describing why we do that process. And of course, strategy is the thing that provides that why. It says, this is the reason we're going after it. And, and another component of his talk involves the motivation. And, and we said this motivation, people don't care what you do, it's why you do it. Uh, again, there's, there's lots and lots of different components that you can throw around this, but his example was the Reverend Martin Luther King didn't give the I have a, or sorry, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. Uh, it's two completely different components when you look at it that way. So let's look at what is strategy. And, and started out about 1950. Uh, you would not have heard this word used in the business context and certainly not in technology context. Uh, prior to that, it was exclusively the domain of the military uh, provence. But the 
Peter Drucker's world got a hold of the concept of strategy and made it a very good study and, and have done a lot of really interesting work around it. But it's come to mean this sort of master plan as long as we're working at this or this grand design that we're, we're doing. And that unfortunately becomes a thing. And, and that thing is, is really not what we value, I think, or find people from the process. Uh, so I go back to the military uh, concept here, which is that a strategy is a pattern, a stream of decisions. And that's a much more useful decision description because the process here that we're describing now is how are we going to go through our process of operating? And we'll look just very briefly at three strategies that give you an idea on this. Um, one of them is Walmart's former business strategy, which they've widely published as everyday low price. It's brilliant, it's, it's understood, it's achievable in, in many people's minds. Uh, if you were on the Walmart Express, the, uh, the regional jets that take you into and out of Bentonville, somebody along that plane ride is guaranteed to say to you, you know, everyday low price. Every associate knows it, every resident of Bentonville knows it. it it's a very successful application of strategy. And in Walmart, they expect their employees all the way up and down, technology and otherwise, to be guided by this strategy. So if you make a decision and you make a decision that focuses in support of strategy, it's very unlikely that you'll receive any sort of um, uh, admonishment from uh, Walmart. You may get coaching, uh, but that's a little bit different uh, on that. So that's example strategy number one. Strategy number two is Wayne Gretzky, and some of you may be familiar with him. His strategy is quite simple. He skates to where he thinks the puck will be. And if you step back from what's going on in an ice hockey match and say, yeah, the chances of, of a, a large person chasing around this small piece of plastic that's moving much, much faster than we, chasing it will not be effective. So going to where the puck will be seems to be the most effective. And he's got a wonderful uh, conversation that he lists between he and his father on his uh, Wikipedia entry out there uh, to take a look at it. Our third example of strategy is Napoleon at Waterloo. And the, the question basically is, how do I defeat the competition when their forces are bigger than mine are? And the answer is divide and conquer. Uh, and again, we'll go back to our decisions. So I'm showing a little map here, but I'm going to blow it out just to give you a little bit more uh, focus on this. This is an analysis that Napoleon did that they still teach in uh, strategy school in the U.S. military. And what his observation of the battlefield was that the British who were in red were being supplied for uh, uh, troops, beans, and butter, right, out of Ostend, which is on the coast of Belgium. So if there is a, a question is where was the food, it's there. That's just a sort of basic question that people go after. And the British in black right there were being surprised, excuse me, I said the British, the Prussians uh, being supplied uh, out of Liege in black there. And, and so Napoleon said, my, my chance is this, if I hit that army, that combined force of red and black, very hard at exactly the right place, uh, it's very likely that I can make them fall apart. And what Napoleon understood, as, as many strategists understand, is that an army, when it's turning around and running, is much more likely to run towards its food, clothing, and shelter than away from its food, clothing, and shelter. So this is part one of Napoleon's strategy at Waterloo here. Part two was to go about and make sure that everybody in his army understood, first, we're going to turn to the right and get the Prussians. And then only after the Prussians are defeated will we turn to the left and get all the British. And you could see this is a fairly complex strategy. When you look at it, first of all, both armies have to be hit in exactly the right spot to make them spring apart for each of them to retreat back to their supply. Secondly, Everybody, everybody, all the soldiers had to turn to the right and defeat the Prussians, then turn to the left and defeat the British. And oh, by the way, please do this while somebody is trying to kill you. This is a non-trivial exercise. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it was unsuccessful, even though it is still taught as an excellent example of strategy. Well, what I'm showing you is the value and the, the most critical necessity of making strategy simple such that everybody can follow these pattern in a stream of decisions. Let me give you a more operational context, perhaps. Uh, if we're the good guys on the left here, uh, we're going to have a different strategy if we're at the top of the mountain than if the bad guys 
are at the top of the mountain. So there's an example all the way around, actually three quick examples, one flat, one left, one right, uh, in order to do that. And this is why this pattern in a stream of decisions is such an important component to adopt, definition to adopt as part of our strategy in this. And that's why a strategy that winds up on a shelf just isn't useful because there's no muscle memory. There's no sense that we've applied it or that it might be useful. In fact, the most cogent comment I found on this comes from General Eisenhower, who said, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plan useless, but planning is indispensable. And I certainly agree with him. It's also been restated slightly more vividly by Mike Tyson, who said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So let's look at what is a data strategy then given that component. It's the highest level of data guidance available. It is the idea that we're gonna focus on a few key things instead of trying to fix everything at once. Focusing on activities that happen to result in business goal achievement, things that are tangible for the business, things that management will understand and appreciate as you're focusing them through, that provides guidance when faced with this stream of decisions or uncertainties. Uh, going here again, this is the idea of general versus specific in order to do this and empowering our associates to do what it is they need to do, understanding uh, the situation best as they do. That Data strategy most usefully articulates how data can be used to support organizational strategy. One of the things that's very key, and we'll come back to this in just a second, but we're no longer gonna filter these data strategies through IT. It's not that IT is bad or anything like that. It's that it needs a different set of uh, perspectives on it. Uh, what my colleague Kathy Das has termed data ears. So we're just gonna adopt that, uh, that terminology for right now. And th this data strategy is going to involve some balance of remediative and proactive measures in order to do this. Now, if you're looking at a data strategy, one of the things that you can measure eventually is its effectiveness. But the time frame that you're going to use to measure this is very important for people to understand will be a longer time frame than most people are used to. Uh, years is the typical measurement. But the volume of the data strategy probably shouldn't be longer than the organizational strategy. That just doesn't seem like a good idea. Most importantly, perhaps, though, put versions in place. If you put version one out of your strategy. When you go to put out version two, nobody will say, hey, I thought we already had a data strategy. Instead, they'll say, yes, version two comes after version one. And measuring understanding all the way around is this common agreement. And that's what we're pulling together is this. Now, this slide I'm going to show you next here, number 32, is from my friend, Chris Bradley, who we've worked together in some really interesting uh, activities. And it's just his summarization of how you could put all this information on one page. I'm gonna urge you not to start off doing this, but maybe maintain it informally. And when you feel like you've really got it, then bring it out. I mean, he's got all sorts of talks where he'll talk about this particular process. Instead, let's look at what we're faced with in terms of options. Somehow, before we have good information about the entire process, we're supposed to come up with a plan that's gonna get us from here to there which requires upfront assumptions because the plans have to be detailed and obviously always uh, underestimate the cost. And instead, what I'm urging is to adopt the use of iterative strategic cycles that will move us steps closer to the goal because over time, this process of showing you these strategies helps us in two areas. One, as we do this more, we become better at it. And when we become better at it, we're able to take and be more effective at cleaning up, which means we have more time to devote to the proactivity of this. I'm going to show you this slide one more time before we finish today. We just wanted to give you a heads up. And the, the most common strategies, Lily, this is Wordle again. You know, it's people are just saying, I'm going to put my faith in these technologies. And that's what these things are. They're not bad, but they in and of themselves can only form a component of your strategy as opposed to your entire strategy. So we're at the end of the first section here. Data strategy specifies how data assets are to be used to support strategy. We've covered what is a strategy, what's a data strategy, and how do they work together, and focused on that pattern in a stream of decisions. And again, think of it in some ways if we need to gamify this. Uh, my strategic focus here 
for the first iteration is going to be on space. So I'm going to go up and zap it like a Pac-Man or something like that. And then for my second time, I'm going to focus on cost. Uh, again, you'll see what this iteration cycle is as we get a little further uh, around this process. So let's move on. Again, a data strategy is necessary for data governance. And this is key because there needs to be three objectives around your data strategy that you need to make progress for, which is, first of all, improving your organization's data. And unfortunately, that is where most people stop. Uh, we also need to improve the way people use their data. The definition of a knowledge worker is somebody who uses data for a living. If we can make them more efficient and effective with that process, that's only going to help our organizations. And only when your people and your data are better with data can you use them effectively to support that strategy. Let me just start out by saying there are some competing definitions in our industry. There's nothing wrong with any of these uh, definitions. They are all fine. But I would ask you to imagine getting on an elevator with an executive who looks over and says, hey, Peter, I understand you're going to be doing something here to help us with data governance. Can you tell us what that is? And those definitions I put on the other pages would not make sense to that individual before we finished that particular ride. So while they are all good definitions, I have a shorter definition that I think I like to use in these instances, which is quite simply that in this case, data governance is managing data with guidance. And of course, the appropriate question comes up almost immediately, would you want your sole non-depletable, non-degrading durable strategic asset managed without guidance? Do you manage any of your other assets without guidance? The answer to both those questions is typically no. If I'm talking to executives, I change data governance to just slightly insert the word decisions. Because one of the things that happens to data is that people make decisions, and I'll show you this in a few slides up, uh, that they don't realize are data decisions. And again, it's that process of putting your data ears on and sort of looking at things from a data perspective as opposed to perhaps the more comfortable perspective where you have been looking at it before because data is our most powerful underutilized asset. It is the only thing, as I said, that is not depletable, degrading, or durable in our organizations. And when we compare them against other strategic level assets, they compare quite favorably, they win, if you will. Uh, in the, you Google the term data is the new oil, you will see 5 million hits out there at uh, uh, Google on that. And it's, I'm happy they're lo looking for it that way, but I don't think it's the way to think about it because unfortunately it only focuses on the exploitation side of data. How do I take that data, move it into a one-way product that is never reused? A better way to think about it is soil. Data is the new soil. There's two reasons this is important. One, you don't just walk about the yard and fling seeds hither and they and expect good things to happen. No, you carefully prepare the soil that you're going to put the seeds in. And the other part of it is a time-related one. You don't start seeds on Monday and expect that you're going to harvest them on Friday. It takes planning. It takes time, but it also needs some sizzle if it is going to sell and would rather have people talking about data in any way, shape or form than not, because it does deserve its own strategy. It deserves attention on par with similar organizational assets, and it requires professional ministration to make up for past neglect. I'm going to show you a very brief example of perhaps where this might be operationalizing itself. This was last year in fall of 2020. There was a Forbes article that I will put up here in just a second when this finishes building that said that American Airlines was currently valued at that time at $6 billion US. And their, interestingly, Advantage program, the data that they have on us American Airlines flyers was valued between 19 and a half and 31 and a half billion dollars. Similarly, over at United, they were valued at 9 billion, whereas their mileage plus program was valued at at least twice what the company was valued at. I will say that this is in process because they haven't managed their data in a way that they know how to monetize it fully at this point in time, and partly because they are still dealing, as all organizations are, with lots of data debt. The time and effort it takes to return your data from its current state to whatever you'd like it to be. I call it getting back to zero because then you can really do the fun stuff. And it generally involves 
undoing existing stuff that is required. And you, you probably don't have skills to undo and redo those efforts. Uh, again, when you start from scratch, it's also typically going to require an annual proof of value. And now you luckily get to get good at both of these things at exactly the same time. There's not a lot of guidance in there. Yet data debt is something that we need to do because it slows progress, decreases quality, and increases our costs all the way around. When we're looking at, in this case, data overall, it becomes a process very much that I call separating the wheat from the chaff. And the idea here is first of all, to understand the question, the answer to the question, excuse me, is well-organized data worth more than less well-organized data? And in order to, to help people understand that, I asked them to go back and look at some information came from a wonderful book here, I'll show you in just a second, uh, which is the idea that before the information age, we still did things like this. We we're putting books together. This is from a book here, wonderfully, How to Make Sense of Any Mess. I think I've sold a number of Abby's books for her, and I, I think she's done an excellent job of how to explain information architecture to people who may not understand this, or maybe their first introduction. Imagine taking the spine off of Abby's book and distributing the pages without page numbers on them. Of course, we all understand that that data becomes ephemeral very, very quickly. So, okay, I've convinced you that better organized data increases in value. How do we go about applying that to our organizations? Well, the next rule is the rule of rot. That is that 80% of your organization's data minimally is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And the question becomes then, which data do I eliminate? Of course, nobody wants to answer that question, but truthfully, most enterprise data is never analyzed. So the question comes up for your organizations, who is qualified to perform this process of eliminating these? Let's take a look at how it works out in the practice. Data strategy and data governance are going to be working closely to support data strategy, which supports the organizational strategy. So what's the organization doing and how can data governance better support organizational strategic implementation? There's no question about what to do. Now, many of you organizationally are driven by regulation. That's another process to get good at uh, for all of you in terms of that. But that's never going to be an organizational strategy unless the organization decides that it might want to become good at complying with regulation, which is something I've seen some people consider. If we expand this a little bit further in Peter's world, uh, data governance would have an input into IT projects as well. There's lots of synergy that could go on between there. Lots of cost savings as well that are very interesting as they work into organizational operations. You can imagine that 80% of organizational data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. That can have a tremendous impact on business operations. We put in some good feedback loops in there. We can now have a fairly complex picture that I probably wouldn't share with others outside of this, I keep it simple like this. And also add in here the role of data stewards because this is how you're going to be effective in doing this. Now, I put in the stewards here in particular because stewards need to understand the data strategy expressed in terms of business goals. They can't be complete geeks and not care about this. They have to have a business mindset. Also, data governance must speak the language metadata in order to do this. If you're using anything other than metadata, you are making a mistake and risking imprecision around all of this. And taking those business goals and metadata and putting them down here in operational world where the stewards can implement it, this is your test of am I being relevant? Of course, the feedback along here is plans, progress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've covered here again, that we need to improve your organization's data, but we also need to improve the way your people use your data. And if you say, I don't have people, all people that need to be smart with data, the answer is then you don't have any knowledge workers. Of course you have knowledge workers and of course they will benefit from improved data literacy because only those types of knowledge and skills can be useful for having people support, use data to support their organizational strategy. Now we're going to talk about some prerequisites. This is the elimination of data debt. Andy, after into 15 minutes, uh, most organizations, when they start, uh, start out pretty straightforward. It's a process where I look at my business needs, and I've been working in this area for years and years. You say to yourself, of course, I would be good at specifying the business needs, and we'll come up with a solution. The problem is, the reason that doesn't work 
Thank you, Morgan Freeman. Oh. This is wrong. Yes. The reason is because we're leaving an important dimension out here, and that is what is the current state of organizational readiness. If we have the good understanding of the organization being able to implement, this is a good place to take a look at it. For example, I have seen organizations implement master data management, another one of the topics that we'll talk about in this series of data ed webinars here, and master data management where they implement it well, technically, but the organization doesn't quite get it. So I will be wandering the halls and hear somebody say, I couldn't figure out where to put the data, so I stuck it in the MDM. Right there, you cringe and say, oh my goodness, I know that's not going to work. So hopefully I've babbled at you for a minute here so that you get that the right way to do this is to match your business need improvements with the current state of organizational readiness so that they are ready to move out in the right direction. We'll come to part two of this framework in just a little bit, but I'm gonna stop here to talk about how getting ready for a data strategy is really important. First of all, there are five, excuse me, three steps that you go through here, prepare for dramatic change and determine how you're going to do the work. There is a change management dimension here. Recruit a knowledgeable enterprise data executive and other talent in here. Realize perhaps that your other executives will be a good input to the discussion, but will certainly not be the ones who would be only making the decision around that and eliminate what I call seven deadly data sins in order to do this. All of these are necessary prerequisites to being able to come back and do then a crawl, crawl walk one strategy. Let's talk about each of these very briefly. Uh, first of all, again, dramatic change and determine how to do the work. I've said already in here that much of the challenges that organizations are reporting in these areas is non-technology challenges. And then you've got people like me who wants to go out and write books that say things like CIOs aren't, which is a terrible thing to say. And I'd like, of course, to be provocative, not rude. And so luckily somebody talked me out of that title and we turned it into this particular one. Here, the case for the chief data officer. The idea, of course, is that we need a new focus of leadership because CIOs are slammed. And what I do here is if we want CIOs to do more with data, we will have to ask them to do less. Does anybody want them to give up this, this, or this? And I named some specific things. And most people said, you know, I like CIOs handling that, sure. And also about 50% of CIOs say to me, yep, I'll be glad to uh, give the data piece to somebody else in this. When this book got translated into Chinese, the title came out, interestingly enough, Chief Data Officer Combat, which kind of did capture what was going on in terms of trying to make the case for it. When we look at CIOs versus CDOs, there's actually a rather synergistic relationship that can be developed between the two. But as I said before, most CIOs uh, at this point are saying, yep, I realize that there's a lot that's gonna be need to be done with data and I've got plenty on my plate. So here you go, CDO, good luck. Uh, call me if you need me. Of course, most of our uh, more uh, gracious than that in terms of working together. And it does represent an element of disruption that is going to occur in our organizations. Because when we do say somebody whose title is chief information officer, and then we say, but we need a chief data officer as well, it becomes confusing to people. And we need them to very carefully articulate what it is that we're attempting to do. And Probably the best place to start with that is to realize that separating data and information are going to be bad ideas in most organizations. What I observe is that most spend time arguing about data versus information. And instead, if they manage them together, they would have a far easier solution to what they're working on. The idea around all of this, though, is that these are socio problems. And we have a class of professionals who can help us called change management and leadership professionals. You may even have them in part of your organization. Several of the local organizations that I work with have them as part of it, including Virginia Commonwealth University, where I am a faculty member. Uh, the idea here is to take a look and understand that just like, and I know we're going to have to explain to kids eventually what is a key and what is a lock. This is an 
old physical lock that you're looking at, uh, those of you that don't recognize it. And you can see that it only works when you line things up correctly. Well, in order to get organizational change, uh, our colleague Mary Lippert did a wonderful model here where she expressed the same kind of thing. I can walk into an organization and I can see alignment on vision. I can see necessary skills. I can see incentive and I can see an action plan, but I also observe frustration. And what I observe not, what I'm missing, are resources. Same thing if I look at vision, incentive, resources, action plan, and I get anxiety, but nobody has the skills. So as Mary said, all of these need to line up perfectly in order to get organizational change. And that's a non-trivial task. It is one of the primary reasons that organizations and organizational strategy have failed because data is the biggest, excuse me, culture is the biggest impediment to shifting about data. I don't know why I'm having trouble reading today. Goodness, I think my uh, cue cards, I'd be better at at this point. Uh, um, by the way, if you're interested in um, learning more about these cultural issues, you can see I'm harping on them quite a bit because they're important. So there's a free case study that you can download here, courtesy of the Association of Computing Machinery uh, on that. So let's go to part two of our remediation here. We're gonna prepare for dramatic change and determine how to do the work. And that is a big piece. I actually introduce in the data literacy book, the concept of AA. Now, a lot of people are a little hesitant when you start talking about this, but when I sit around a table with a group of executives and I introduce the concept of Alcoholics Anonymous or any self-help program, many around the table will nod their heads because they've had experience with it. Not that they know, but they know somebody who knows or they've been exposed to it. It's the best way we have of making changes in behavior where behavior needs to be changed. So I don't preach it to you or anything, but I do actually use it as a way of determining whether people are serious about it. If I can talk to your leadership and describe them to me in terms of changing, like an AA type of change, where the executives go, yeah, I know what change you're talking about. Uh, we're more likely to have a productive concept around that productive conversation. The second part of this is how do you get people? Now, the interesting part of the people discussion is that we don't really have it well-defined even within our own data industry, much less as we, the data industry, interface with the business and the IT communities uh, that are on here. But before I go into that, I'm gonna deviate slightly just to give you a sense of why. And the answer is Enron. I know that's a terrible answer, but it's a really good one. So. And Ron, you have to remember, was named America's most innovative company for six years in the row. And on the seventh year, it suffered its largest chapter 11 bankruptcy in history. It was one of those, oh my God, the sky is falling out. By the way, wonderful conspiracy of fools by Kurt Eichenwald, who's been in the news recently as well, unfortunately. But uh, it's a great actual beach book that you can take with you. So we're at August of 2001. And the reason nobody remembers this was because it obviously occurred right before 9-11. But right before 9-11, Enron was going from $90 a share to 26 cents a share. And Dynergy, a company, came to their rescue and said, we're going to be a white knight rescue. We're going to give you several billion dollars to help you get through a temporary cash crunch and Enron spent the entire amount of money in one week. After you marry somebody, it's a bad time to discover that your partner has a business practice that's to any person Enron for any amount of money for any purchase at any time. Of course, you agree with me, these are bad fiscal controls. And Enron had the nerve to go back to Dynergy at the end of the week and say, can I have some more money? And Dynergy said, wait a minute, what happened to the several billion I gave you last week? And Enron said, I don't know. Now, I'm giving you this as a very bad example of clearly terrible practices around the process of being responsible financially. We've since implemented, and I've always in the accounting industry, looked at objective qualifications that say to people, you must have certain degrees or pass certain certifications if you're going to be in that type of a position. But in IT, it's been very different. First of all, again, we start with knowledge workers. What do we teach them about data? In general, absolutely nothing. And of course, what percentage of them need it? Why that would be 100% last time I looked uh, on this. What do we teach IT professionals about data, though, is even more shameful. We give them one course on how to build a brand new database. If there is one skill on planet Earth we need less of, it is how to build a, plan a new database uh, on this. We have plenty of people who are good in that but we give them no concept of data as an organizational resource. And the 
IT professionals and others who go through these programs get the idea that data is a technical skill that's only needed when developing new databases. Now, of course, you've all heard the Maslow adage, if the only tool you know is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail, then you shouldn't be surprised as well when we've tried to solve every data problem by creating more and more databases. Gee, big surprise there. And no surprise also that many companies also indicate that they have made bad decisions based on bad data. And that's not surprising because business decision makers and technical decision makers are not data knowledgeable. Similarly, they make bad decisions then, or collectively perhaps, uh, that result in poor treatment of organizational data assets, poor organizational quality, and bad organizational outcomes. Of course, you can see we're in the lather, rinse, and repeat cycle here. We want to break out of this particular cycle. Thank you again. Morgan Freeman. The most typical example of this is implementing salesforce.com and then deciding to clean the data in salesforce.com. They should obviously occur in the other way around, primarily not because of anything good or bad about Salesforce, it's fine software, but because Salesforce gets perceived and it's hard for users to tell the difference between Salesforce loaded with good data and Salesforce loaded with bad data uh, around this. The reason we had to break data out was a focus reason. There are lots of things we can focus on, but we clearly need to put more focus or a chief focus around a single thing. And we've seen this happen in the financial area where there's a chief financial officer, a chief risk officer, perhaps uh, a chief medical officer. And also the chief financial officer does not balance the books. The chief risk officer does not test software and the chief medical officer does not perform surgery around this. Consequently, this lack of focus has been challenging and we need to bring in a person, if you will, one throat to choke to be responsible for data. But are we going to ask the people currently in our organization to be the only input into that? And I would say no. I think that you need to, and we have it in the federal government already, sharing hiring panels and informal information behind the scenes so that people can understand uh, what types of chief data officers they are mandated to have. By the way, it's a part of the law. We won't go into that here, but it's a wonderful uh, development, at least in the federal government area. So we are saying, in fact, we need some help recruiting somebody for the top data job. That would be my title for it because that can exist at any level of the organization. And unfortunately, as soon as you say chief, uh, many chiefs band together and say, do we have enough chiefs? Do we need to add another one to that? And that's, of course, the wrong conversation uh, to have on that. Uh, many organizations have adopted an enterprise data executive. That's perfectly fine as well. I don't mind what you call it. It's obviously known as the chief data officer and is seen as being responsible for data governance and other types of things that are in there primarily focusing on leveraging the data assets in support of strategy, being unconstrained by an IT project mindset because it's hard to do strategy project by project and reporting to the business. So there's a good deal of synergy in that context uh, in order to do that. And it's very likely that the first enterprise executive is going to use up all of their political capital. So we're seeing a lot of organizations rent a first enterprise data executive to make changes, to do things that they can easily do and put in place where they don't need to uh, worry so much about being nice and, and, and recouping later on, and that somebody else can come in and take over uh, later on around that. So again, not a happy prospect around that, but it isn't all uh, roses, that's for sure in there. Let's talk very briefly as well about the seven deadly data sins. These are the large piles of data debt that organizations face in order to do this. Luckily, there were seven of them, so it worked out really, really nicely. And I'm going to start off with number two, which we just finished talking about, lacking data leadership. Uh, again, many organizations will come in and say, well, because I have an advanced degree or am able to really understand data well, um, I should be the data lead in the organization. And that may be true, but that individual is also going to have to understand an ability to put the problem in a business context and to work with their uh, peers in that same context uh, around that as well. Most organizations have not developed a robust programmatic means of developing shared data. And consequently, they have a tougher time sharing data. It costs more, it takes too long, and it uh, doesn't deliver full results around all of that, that their data is still run 
as a byproduct of an IT project. And so, yes, we have some data pieces for IT. That's good, but again, you can't assemble a program from a bunch of disparately connected data projects. Also, we have to manage expectations properly. Again, gets to the political, uh, excuse me, process and uh, uh, people parts of things. Uh, again, wonderful stories I can tell around this uh, won't at this point in time, but just to say that it's very, very key to make sure that you make everybody on board and understand what it is we're trying to do, that we are measuring time in years as opposed to uh, weeks and months uh, in this uh, or certainly not uh, uh, sprints in the same context here. Uh, there's a sequencing that needs to be followed during data strategy implementation. I think I've got a part of a chapter on that in the book. And then failing to address the major cultural and uh, change management issues. The number one deadly sin though is not understanding data centric thinking. And so we're gonna explore that just a little bit to the detriment of the others and just say, we've seen a lot of this over the past 10, 15, 20 years, data-driven, data-centric, data-focused, data-provocateur, et cetera. Great titles, but what does it all really mean? And that's a, a big challenge for us. We've got to develop some objective characteristics around it or nobody can look at it objectively and say you're doing it or not. So I took my inspiration from the Agile Software Manifesto, which is very straightforward. Over time, their goal was four postulates. Individuals and interactions are more valued than process and tools. Working software is more valuable than comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration is more valuable than contract negotiation. And responding to change is more valuable than following a plan. Similarly, on our side, I've put them up as well. And uh, again, tried to do it in just the exact same, very simplistic fashion to say that, well, there is value of the things on the right. We value things on the left more. Uh, data programs uh, over IT programs. And again, I'll just drive through them real quick, which is just to say that if we really understand what happens in their data is the foundation, the heart and soul, if you will, of IT and everything else and business, and that you've got to build your data program as a real solid foundation and then build IT on top of that, that you need to understand the idea of making sure that you're investing in improved information, improved data over technology, because technology will not deliver you any improvement in the data. It is merely passed straight through that you need to have a shared stable organizational data over IT components. Again, value both sides of the equation, but one side should win out uh, and receive investment around that. And finally, data reuse. Uh, again, just the fact that most organizational data isn't reused is, is, is a prize use because it all is a problem. So uh, again, just some things out there. If those sound interesting, uh, come on, engage in a dialogue about it, and we'll, we'll talk more uh, around this. This may not be the final version of it. It's, it's version two already. So uh, we're, we're moving right onwards. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of things that are preventing you from really jumping forward and doing this in a way that will get you also to Carnegie Hall, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So again, we're assuming we're right here. We've eliminated the, the prerequisites and we're ready to now start off and lather, rinse and repeat. And there are five steps in this process. Uh, I'll just pop them all up there and then we'll go through them uh, in order to do this. But it, it hopefully will look very familiar to some of you because uh, it is actually the theory of constraints. And uh, let's go back to our strategy framework. Remember we were here, we blew this up and said, not only when we have a perfect match between these two, or at least a close match between these, should we actually invest in something, put together a roadmap. And the other part of this diagram that's crucial is that we've got to have a balance in our results between producing business value and creating new capabilities. If we do only business value, we won't get the muscle memory of what we need to do as an organization. And if we only do the muscle memory part, the right-hand side of that, we won't create business value. Uh, again, management will think we're a science project and that's just not the way we want to be seen. We need to have it all uh, pulled together. So balancing business value as well as development of capabilities is a challenging, challenging process, uh, but that can be done. And it actually means we are able to do more with less as we go around it. When you talk to others about data strategy, they tend to say, yeah, it's a combination of all these things. And while these things are great, I've yet to meet any organization that has all of them ready to go and ready to integrate in here. Again, Morgan Freeman. This is 
wrong. Thank you again, sir. I just love that he agrees with me on this. Uh, again, yes, it just doesn't work. There's no way. Instead, remember our data strategy is more like a, a video game where we're trying to eliminate, but what we're going to do is go around this particular cycle and watch at how to approach that. And it makes a lot of sense because then once I've built the first one, that I've got that one taken care of, I can go off to the next one, reduce the data depth that's out there, and again, try after the uh, cost one. Now we go after that. And again, is that my way around the whole process? And as I've said it several times, The Goal, uh, wonderful book by Elihu Goldratt. Uh, when you're literally just talking to people as well, and they will very often reference this as well. It's a wonderful book describing the theory of constraints, which says that if we view our system, our data production system in this case, as being limited by achieving one or more of its goals with a small number of constraints, then we focus on that constraint, restructure, refractor, whatever it is we need to do, get rid of that because the chain in data is only as strong as the weakest link. And so consequently, we need to address it in exactly that manner by making sure that each data cycle has a specific purpose that we use where we identify a constraint, we exploit the constraint quickly and easily. If that doesn't work, we restructure to make sure that we bring all the power to bear on the constraint, uh, focus it, repeat the other process until it's complete, and then uh, uh, go back and start over again. If we talk in data terms, it's a little bit uh, more noticeable perhaps. How can your organization best support organizational strategy by using data in order to do this? What is the one thing or top three things that are blocking you the most? What are things that we can do to correct it operationally? What can we do to rapidly restructure and fix this? If we can't do it that way, we need to then subordinate all non-constraints. Other projects need to slow down. We need to improve these activities uh, to the uh, expense of the others by addressing that particular constraint. And again, if that doesn't work, repeat the process. If this looks a lot like plan, do, uh, check, act, plan, do, check, act, you know, the, the Deming cycle, it's the same thing. Yes, exactly. Continue to, to go around it. And that's the part that you want to get good at. Because once you have a team that understands how to go through this process, they will get this down very quickly to a lather, rinse, and repeat process and be able to put time and attention into the specifics of the projects that you're looking at in a way that produces valuable results to the organization almost immediately. Let me dive into a specific example here. In this example, this is the DIMBOK. If those of you are seeing it just first, I apologize. That's the Data Management Body of Knowledge, 10 sizes surrounding a center of data governance on this. Uh, just to observe you guys, if you look at this symbol, it doesn't tell you one's more important than the others, although clearly putting data governance at the center is uh, making some sort of a judgment around that process uh, to say that it's a, a governing process uh, in order to do that. So let's just take an organization that says, I'm going to use best practices as I'm told to do in the federal government, the law now that you do this, uh, and, and I'm going to make a collection of data that's going to be better in order to do this. Most organizations will say, which of the pie slices do I start with? Thinking it's one to the exclusion of the, in more likelihood, your strategic implementation of this will be better considered as perfecting operations in three data management practice areas, three pie slices or uh, two pie slices and the centerpiece. Uh, think of it like a three-legged stool, where again, you're trying to get structural soundness you're not going to sit comfortably on a two or one legged stool uh, in order to do this. It's likely you're also going to need three areas of the DIMBOK in order to do this. And the first one might be, let's do some data, bear, uh, data warehousing, but also do some data governance and data quality management around this. And we'll do one cycle at trying to implement X number of uh, months of work or, or sessions of work or cycles of work, however you manage uh, around that. And each of you get a one participation trophy for being part of that. And I don't mean to 
done a great participation in trophies, uh, but it's that you've done it once, that's good. That's what we're looking at because most organizations have done it none times, right? So now we're going to go to our second iteration on this. We're going to go around the data warehouse, but now I'm going to look at it from a metadata management perspective and gain some experience there. But now I've got two X points in data governance, data warehousing, one X in metadata around this. Our third strategic implementation here might be uh, very similar, but now changing and with better understanding the metadata to a more refined component of metadata, which is reference and master data uh, on this, and, and really finishing up the project here with three X's of data warehousing experience, three X's of data governance experience, but one X of reference and master data experience. And this is precisely what I want you to understand and take away as we look at what's happening in this. I told you I'd show you this twice. Uh, again, doing these strategic cycles over time increases the capacity and improves your internal processes and then changes your focus from reactive to proactive about this. And if you get really good at it, then you can parallelize your operations. So now you can spin up another team, multiple teams in order to get started. It's really just up to the organization to understand, achieve, provide, demonstrate value around all these. And this is really the key where most organizations don't start out. When I look at data strategies, they say, yeah, we're going to do all these great things of data, Wonderful. Uh, what's that going to do for the business? That's the real question that you want to ask. So by keeping it focused in this tight cycle and looking at it as getting a team to do better with what you're doing, you will eventually get to the point where you're good enough to spin out a second team and a third team, uh, depending on capacity as you're implementing all of the rest of these. All right. So I've got just a couple minutes to summarize here. Let's go back through the very beginning on this. Uh, I won't try the camera, I've got it unplugged. But uh, again, do you see what I mean when I say a data strategy it says, how are we gonna take the data assets that we have in our organization and make sure that data strategy, excuse me, the data that strategy for the organization is better supported. There are a number of ways to do it. You as the data leaders are most qualified to actually do that work in there. But in order to do it, you have to understand strategy is not a 100 page document. It is a stream pattern in a stream of decisions. And a data strategy then is a data strategy focused on, which is what are we going to do from data's perspective for the next calendar cycle with the efforts of my team in order to try and improve these things. Because only by working together will we have them work in the way that a data strategy does support the organizational strategy. And if it does it correctly, the organization will be turning around to the data leadership and saying more. Similarly, data strategy is necessary for effective data governance. The biggest challenge that we have in data governance, and I'll just give you a data point, Shannon and I were both at a conference in early December, <laughs> excuse me, that was uh, wonderful, but the average data governance office of the attendees of that conference was one, and that was, pretty astounding. It's great that people are out trying to learn more about it and, and do this, but it's also very challenging as an organization to come up with resources in order to do this or to demonstrate effectiveness. So the data strategy is what tells your data governance what's most important. And again, it's going to be some combination of improving your organization's data, but also improving the way people use their data. This can be accomplished by skilling up your existing knowledge workers, but it can also be put in place right now at HR by screening for additional uh, data literacy as you're bringing new people on board, particularly in the knowledge workers. Because only once you've improved their data and improved the way people use their data, can you improve the way people use data to support the strategy. It's a little bit complex and it needs a little bit of work in order to do that. This also then leads us to the problem that most organizations run head into, which is the lack of strategic preparation, the lack of organizational readiness for something like this, because the organizations are very challenged in order to pull all of this together. They don't compensate for the lack of data competencies, and they don't eliminate the seven deadly sins to this. Uh, again, we just finished off with the iteration description, which is pretty straightforward, lather, rinse, and repeat, just like this uh, cereal bottle, <laughs> just like the shampoo bottle, boy. <clears throat> Better watch that. I got one more thing as we're getting ready for our questions and answers uh, on this that I want to run through. But again, just to reiterate that the multi page document strategy is less useful, especially at first. Too much time is accomplished at the expense of becoming proficient 
at the cycling process, which is the better way to think about all of these things. Now, let me just take this one last minute here and indulge myself uh, with a, a trip back to 1977, the year I graduated high school uh, in McLean, Virginia here. And if there was one thing I hated more than anything else, it was this song uh, by the Bee Gees, which is uh, Stayin' Alive. You can see I don't hate this song of it anymore, but uh, man, in 1977, it was a disaster. I couldn't stand this song because it didn't have any live musicians. It was all done by computers. Look at the career I ended up with. Boy, that's ironic, isn't it? So Bruce Springsteen starts playing this song. And better still, it's to understand here, not the song was at fault, but obviously the way in which the song was instrumented or produced or however you'd like to do it. And I'm going to cut the sound back off on that now. I think it'll cut up your song as well uh, around that. But staying alive as a song is a, a fabulous piece of music. But to look at this specific performance, which has only been played three times, according to the Bruce Springsteen database of all songs in the world uh, that's out there, he took this on his his uh, band just literally the night before, which means the element of practice is critical around this as well. And only because he had a crack band that could do this, could he spring this song on them on the plane on the way in and they pull off a performance to this. Now I don't have time here to play you the whole performance around this. Uh, instead, we'll tell you that we've got some upcoming events uh, that we'd love you to pay attention to and hopefully see you at it. Some of these things, again, there's some event pricing on the books, but now it's time to turn it back over to Shannon for our question and answer. And I'm in the black circle there somewhere guys. <laughs> well, Peter, thank you so much. And thanks to our attendees for being so patient as uh, things started coming through a little bit better. Um, I know we'll work on that bandwidth issue and, and make sure things are a little bit more clear in the future. So, uh, and just to answer the most commonly answered questions, we will be sending, I will be sending a follow up email for this webinar by end of day Thursday to all registrants with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout. There's been some great comments and um, resources put in the chat as well. Um, so diving in here, Peter, what skill set a person must have to be a data strategy maker at an organization? Tough question. Um, I think that the, I hate to say I know them when I see them, which sounds terribly subjective. Um, what I see in people that I recognize, and there are people who've been frustrated, perhaps in IT, perhaps in the business, who for years and years have been afraid to say more because they know that nobody else uh, either agrees or supports uh, the challenges that they see. But so many of the challenges that organizations have, and I, I say this over and over again, that, that, that the root of all business challenges is a data problem in one form or another. These people recognize that this is nothing new, but it's not recognized more broadly. So there's an, an element of frustration pent up frustration. In fact, we see this in DEMA as well. Uh, those of you that didn't catch the, the intro on this, I'm the president of the Data Management Association. And we see that our, our members come to us after about 10 to 15 years of frustration in IT. And basically what happens is they say data three times and somebody says to them, Peter, you said data three times, now you're the data person, right? So the, the question is to what skills, I, I think, the skills that come in is certainly systems thinking to understand that data is the root of literally everything that happens out there in the, the business world. Good people and process explanation skills. Uh, I didn't know that I had a nice gift to be able to explain things easily to people. And I apparently do have that. Uh, when I was working for the US military, I would get an order that said, get Peter and his 100 slides to Detroit or Denver or whatever city he was needed in because they needed something explained to somebody. And uh, it's a good skill to have. And if you understand that ability uh, to be able to do it, that would be really good. A lot of patience too, uh, just that you're gonna be listening and learning and, and, and doing all sorts of things around that. Uh, great question though. And I don't know that anybody's really put a list like that together. So maybe that would be a wonderful thing for a future webinar. Uh, reach out and, and maybe we can toss those ideas around somewhere. Thanks so much for the question. I love it. Um, so Peter, do you have a source for the 95% of data space problems being attributed to human error? I'm familiar with an IBM study from a decade ago uh, attributing 90% of data breaches to human error, but not data all data problems. Any re new uh, results out there? Yeah, so uh, Randy Bean and Tom Davenport write the forward for Randy Bean's uh, seminar that he releases every year. And he literally this weekend released the latest version of it. So the latest version is the 2020 uh, data survey or whatever it is. And he asks a specific question in there. Um, are the problems in your organization process uh, uh, people or technology? 
And overwhelmingly, over the past four years, it's been 80-20 at the minimum uh, on that, rising to as low as 5% technology problems and 95% people in process. So this is a very, very consistent result, supported by wonderful academic uh, research that is entirely supportable. And there's just no question at this point in time that we are crying out for another component of data leadership in here that focuses in on these people in process problems and tries to do something. By the way, let's just think of something else too. If we have people in process problems that are problems that clearly organizations are reporting repeatedly over a five year period, the same proportionality, no improvements uh, around that. That also says what is going to address those? Data governance is the tool to address those exact type of problems. Uh, there's certainly nothing else in our data toolkit that has uh, the equipment in order to do something like that. So again, great question. Thank you for asking. And you uh, have on hand or off the top of your head, provide a real business world example of a data strategy statement? Uh, so this is the pattern in a uh, stream of decisions uh, around this. And rather than organize something around somebody else's, let's go to uh, the uh, Walmart statement, which is one of the more clear ones forward uh, in order to do that. And when, and I observed this, this is the wonderful thing about working for a, a really interesting organization such as this one. Uh, again, they let this guy their everyday behavior. And more important than just that, I didn't call it out on the slide, it also governs the behavior around work groups. So the work groups focus on strategy. It's a component they understand. So if I'm looking at a specific data instance of this and the organizational strategy is everyday low price, then the things I do in data probably are not going to be useful if I start with the A variables and cleanse them and work my way through the, the Z variables, right? That's just not a, a, a very good way of responding to the business. But if I find a way where I can impact lots of prices in a measurable way that helps both the consumers and the corporation in this case, uh, that is a very demonstrable way of data strategy helping out in that context. So what would happen in the data group is that they would say, if this is the organizational strategy, our data strategy to support this strategy needs to be X. And we're gonna focus on trying to eliminate three things in order one, two, and three. By the way, two and three can change depending on what you learn from one, but that's what your essence of your plan is, which is a lot better than having somebody read through a hundred pages of something that probably, and most of the time, does not turn out to occur. Perfect. So, um, Peter, are we using the term quote unquote strategy from a military definition? Does it make sense to use orient, observe, decide, act loops as a framework for iterating our organization's data strategy? It does in, in that kind of context. So the, the first piece that I brought up here was that strategy as a business term only started becoming popular in the 1950s when the, the management consulting industry discovered the word. Uh, so without that particular insight, it's unlikely we would have come across it under any context and that the original definition for it was much more of a process rather than a thing. And so by focusing on a process, we can improve it. Whereas when you have a thing, you only observe whether you correctly or not achieved it. Uh, on there, unless that thing is a living thing, in which case you have to worry about the update problem. So the framework that was suggested there is absolutely reasonable to incorporate underneath this context of pattern in a stream of decisions. And that's really what the concept of strategy in the military originated with, and the concept of business should not d differ far from that, or they should use a different word. So in the military strategy, you're out there in the world, and the world has different things. There are forests and trees and lions and tigers and bears, and your unit needs to be able to respond, needs to be equipped to respond to all of those things that are happening. Uh, in some ways, this is very complementary of agile uh, enterprise management, uh, and it's a, a very useful component in there, but yes, absolutely. I'm going back to the military definition, explicitly saying that the component of strategy in here, well, let me give you one more example. 
uh, it's too hard to figure out this one, but I had a, a, a colleague who was working in one of the big uh, manufacturing companies and their CEO decided that they needed data strategy, which is a wonderful thing to have. And the data governance lead was reporting up to the CEO at that point in time. And in that process of the, you know, having the CEO's ear, literally, it was very easy to convince the CEO that a, a data strategy made sense uh, uh, in, in that part of things. And while that was okay, uh, the implementation then was then to go out and hire some 10 big uh, uh, firm consulting uh, people to a tune of about 10 million bucks to develop a 100 PowerPoint slide deck that literally has been sitting on the shelf and hasn't done a thing. So uh, again, hopefully your experiences have been uh, better than that, but it is nevertheless a big, big challenge with all of these data strategies, trying to get something that is operational and useful. And that you don't want to invest too much, but you don't want to invest too little. It's quite a balancing act. Good question. A lot of great questions here coming in. So Peter, you know, we suppose we have an enterprise data governance program in place with the various practice areas, people, metadata, quality, life cycle, et cetera. Would a data strategy for specific data initiatives be informed by the data governance program or will it shape governance to be more effective? In other words, is it a chicken and egg problem in practice or does strategy envelop governance? It absolutely should be a chicken and egg problem. And of course, the wonderful thing about the chicken and the egg problem, if you want to get real technical, is that they actually figured out and it was the uh, uh, chicken that came first uh, in, in that context. But I'm back to this diagram here. No, you're not going to spend your time thinking about data strategy four week exercise once a year and figure where things go. Although that's not a bad way to do it. It should be more of a continuous process, but it clearly is not going to be the dominant set of cycles, set of topics that are, are occupying those cycles. And those data governance cycles then are things done. Easy to get behind something that says not only are we doing this because we think it's the thing that right thing for the data group to do, but it's also the right thing for the data group to do to make the organization achieve its strategy. After all, that is what we are here for. We are part of this larger organization that we want to support uh, in order to do this. So it's a very nice people about strategy. And I, I started talking to people about data strategy more than 30 years ago, and they would look at me and go, what do we need a strategy for our data for? And uh, generally what I had to say at that point in time was, well, sir, the Russians are doing it all the time. And that would get their attention uh, very, very uh, quickly uh, in that. So it's very much that these two should influence each other as I'm showing them on the diagram here. But at the same time, it's not necessarily a continuous process. The data governance office should be running hopefully multiple cycles of work that is designed to reduce the data debt and improve the way the organization uses its data in support of strategy. Again, great question. Thank you for asking. So fan data decision slide, this appears to be a knowledge capacity and hiring talent acquisition perspective that organizations need to be aware of their organization. So the bad data there, decision slide, yeah. Oh, 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 that thing, yes. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, would you repeat the question, Shanna? Sure, yeah. This appears to be, um, so on that bad data decision slide, this appears to be a knowledge capability and hiring talent question perspective that organizations need to be aware of their organization. Let me ask any of you all, were any of you screened for your data savvy on your way in? Um, my guess is the people who were doing the screening either didn't know to, what questions to ask or, or perhaps uh, just assumed that your reputation was uh, good enough in order to do that. Yeah, this happens all the time. I'll go back and elaborate a little bit on the salesforce.com example because it is so ubiquitous in that I have seen 12 of these things within the past 18 months. Uh, so this is a situation where an arbitrary deadline, a uh, technology driven, driven deadline of salesforce.com will be installed by, again, I'm just going to make up a day in March 1st. Well, we all know only one third of IT projects succeed with full functionality within the schedule that they've provided and again, delivering for the cost that they originally contracted for, uh, which means if I dentist had that bad a record, I would find myself another dentist. Uh, 
uh, we don't have good records around IT track. So consequently, these bad decisions are often bad data decisions. And when I educate executives about executive data literacy, they then realize that that decision, even though they just wanted Salesforce to be in because they thought it would help improve sales faster, which generally is what Salesforce's claim to fame is, uh, it wouldn't help if salesforce.com got implemented with bad quality data. I have one example. Uh, one organization was very courageous and actually put their name behind the tens of millions of dollars they were able to save by taking what would have been a bad data decision right at this part of the decision making process where it says bad data decisions they came to a wonderful decision maker who said so how much of the data do we actually have converted in order to do this and the answer was 40 percent and the individual said, go back and come back when that number is 80%, I'll authorize the overruns on this project. So instead of finishing for an arbitrary deadline, they measured the effectiveness of the process, made a better data decision and claimed specifically a $40 million a year advantage the first year alone. Now, $40 million may or may not be peanuts to your organization, but most people say, yeah, it's more than my salary, so I'm probably going to report it and say uh, I helped to bring that about. Again, great question in order to do that. People don't know that they're making bad decisions. The other example here, since you've given me opening it in order to do this, is the decision to enable your programs. I, I see so many organizations that come along. And what they do is they say, okay, we're gonna have a data governance program. We're gonna explain the data governance. We're gonna explain data quality to people. We're gonna explain data profiling to people. We're gonna explain data meta and all of the things that go into making up these uh, components in there. And I, I say, no, everybody outside of data will hear blah, 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 just like Charlie Brown hearing the teacher. But the one word they will get is data. So give yourself a data program and make it very simple. Managing data with guidance, but more importantly, make management understand that that's a data decision. So it's not terribly offensive, I think, to say, put your data ears on and, and rethink about that data. If you force them to implement that, they won't have had time to cleanse the data that's going into Salesforce. If the data in Salesforce isn't cleansed, a Salesforce becomes upset because they want their customers to get a good experience with Salesforce uh, on this. And users are generally unsophisticated in unable to tell the difference between Salesforce with good data and Salesforce with bad data. They just see Salesforce. And then they look at it and they say, Salesforce sucks. Now, please don't take that out of context. I'm sure somebody will make it into a rap video where Peter's running around saying, Salesforce sucks, Salesforce sucks, Salesforce sucks, right? No, that's not the case. Somebody's made bad decisions. I would think Salesforce should be reaching out to me and saying, who are those people we'd like to correct that customer perspective? Uh, and anybody tweet at Salesforce these days? Anyway, uh, I think I've babbled enough on that. Shannon, back over to you. What a great question that was. Indeed. So uh, another question, you know, while we have an uh, overall organization's organizational strategy, can we have multiple data strategies for various data initiatives, but all informed by and informing the overall enterprise data governance? I ask because I find data strategies are devised every time a data initiative is undertaken or proposed. The question I would ask in return on that would be, are they achieved after they're proposed? Um, I would be afraid of being associated with lots of promise and under delivery uh, around that. But the, the question is, can there be separate pieces to it? Yes, and you use the word coordinated. I think that's all that you really need to have. When you look at where most organizations are, and again, I've worked with some organizations that this is not true, uh, but in most organizations, they are really not the pinnacle of uh, success in terms of how they manage their data. They're challenged all the way around. They're trying really, really hard. Uh, but it's just not an easy task in order to, to come up with something. And so consequently, what they need to do is focus in just a couple of areas. Uh, they have limited resources. Again, I mentioned to you the conference that Shannon and I were back at in December. The average data governance office was one, right? So that's not a lot of people in order to do that. So the, the question of breaking something into, so one of the things might be, I'm going to use my elevator slide just because it has three parts to it. Um, your strategy might have three parts to it. One, make sure that you get on the elevator when the bosses 
on the elevator, right? Then have a good speech prepared so that you can deliver something to the boss that makes you look good as opposed to foolish uh, on that. And then hopefully ask for a follow-up meeting. By the way, what I've just given you there is a really good pitch for what you should be doing in data. Almost every one of your data practice areas, we call them the pie wedges around the data, the DIMBOK uh, that are there as well as data governance, you should have absolutely a 30 second, a three minute, a 30 minute and a three hour version of that ready to go. The idea is that everybody on your team needs to have the same response to what's going on there. So for example, when they say, when's that data strategy gonna be ready? I heard you're gonna have that ready by Friday. You say, well, well, we'll have some things ready for you by Friday, but we really are taking a different direction than perhaps the typical organization here. We're not going to have a plan that we're going to try to guess what's going to happen in the future and instead come up with something that is useful. So the question was, would all three of those elements be part of that? If I was going to call my strategy elevator pitch, then clearly part one, part two, and part three need to occur. Although there's clearly a dependency in there. And I'm sure that's what the questioner was asking for when they said coordination back and forth with all of these uh, pieces, making sure that they all worked back and forth. So short answer, yes, but key is to make sure that you have that coordination able to go back and forth on that. So Peter, is it mandatory to have to, for a business strategy to have a data strategy? Since there are many middle-sized companies that don't have a defined business strategy, how should this be addressed to define the, uh, for the, to address the definition of data strategy? Once again, a great question. I, I hadn't actually dived into that, but I have seen it happen enough times. I think I'm fairly safe making the statement that in a small size company, I think a data strategy is probably more useful than an IT strategy. And I don't mean that to disparage IT. I just mean, I think that the data strategy can be more effective in that context. Remember what we're doing here is we're looking up for guidance in many decisions that we make, a pattern in a stream of decisions. And people in these organizations, if they adopt the data strategy, for example, that we're going to make sure that we are not at risk for GDPR or something like that. And we're gonna make sure that somebody qualified handles all that, we're gonna transfer all that risk to somebody else. Then that will become the philosophy around that. And people won't say, oh, I'll just collect a spreadsheet's worth of stuff here or there and you know, do something that's perhaps not authorized officially. You, know, you see air quotes come out from time to time in, in all of that. I think that the, the concept around understanding what's going on from a data perspective is different from IT in particular because of one factor. And the factor is simply this, growth. Now, in most small companies, you're not necessarily concerned about um, what we call surveillance capitalism, but you should be at this point. So basically, if you're not capturing data on somebody else. Somebody is capturing data on you. It's eat or be eaten out there. Uh, hunt or be hunted uh, as far as uh, what's going on. And the idea of needing to have some sort of an approach to that is critical because your IT isn't growing at the rate your data is growing. Your IT staff isn't growing at the rate data is growing. Data is growing at a rate that is just almost uncomprehensible, incomprehensible to, to imagine. I'm going to give you a, a URL here, domo, D-O-M-O.com, and look for, um, I think it's called the year in data or um, something like that, uh, where they do every year this visualization of what's happening in the data world. There is nothing else that's expanding out there. And because we can't see it, feel it, and touch it, it's very difficult for people to get interested in it. Again, just going back to the elevator pitch here, it would be very difficult in most cases to get executives interested in data had not we been talking about data for the past decade in terms of big data and all the rest of the, the data science -y things that have, have gone on around this. Um, but it, it's just absolutely critical to understand that when management is trying to approach this subject, if we can do a good job ourselves of saying, hey, here's 
what needs to happen. Here's an articulation on this. Here's a, a short rehearsed speech uh, that we can, we can deliver over and over again. And I'm sorry, Shannon, my cat just jumped in front of me and completely distracted me. So now I'm, I even lost the track of the, the sentence. Give me, give me a, a word so I can close this one up and, and actually respond to the questioner's question on this. <laughs> You were, you were like my cat, right? <laughs> <laughs> you were almost there, the, the helper that maybe not so helpful, but um, uh, and you probably hit the question already too, right? <laughs> I did. Well, no, I have it here. You know that you know, uh, you know how it should be addressed. The definition of data strategy is the ultimate goal for it, for especially for middle-sized companies who middle size, yeah. yeah. And, and so, what because it is thank you uh, for doing it because it is changing so dramatically uh, in there uh, the way my cats would multiply if I let them right uh, we'll just say it that uh, in there it, it's it's something that needs to be something needs to be done about it and if you the longer you wait the longer you delay the more catch up work there's going to be the more data debt that you will incur and the more you'll have to undo before you're ready to start doing and that's very tough all the way around thank you Shannon I appreciate that yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we've got time for at least one, for about one more question here. You know, um, what is the optimum data strategy iteration duration? Ah, so in other words, what should those cycles be based on in order to do this? What a good question. The process of going through the theory of constraints uh, is actually written up in the goal and I make my students read it. Uh, and Shannon's heard me say this before, but my wife, when she and I got together 20 years ago and started, you know, what do you do? What do you do? Kind of thing. She said, all right, well, look here, if we're going to talk about business, you must read this book called The Goal before we try to have any business conversations. I was like, what? I've read tons of business books. Why do I have to read it? You know, if you're not going to read the book, we're not going to have conversations. So of course I read the book and understood why it was she wanted me to read this. It's a way of viewing problems to say that we'd like to achieve a certain level of performance, but something is impeding our performance achievement. Something is getting in the way. If we don't explicitly try to get that thing out of the way, it will continue to be in the way. Now, another uh, colleague, Tom Redmond, calls these hidden data factories, although that's a more of a disparate view. But think of a constraint as something that causes one or more types of hidden data factories in your organization. And to exploit them, are you going to need something as simple as, oh, I'll change from allowing users to enter data free form to making them pick off of a pick list? Maybe, or is there something more fundamental than this in that in order for somebody to actually understand the information that they're supposed to be helping the customer with to improve the customer experience, they're trying to integrate information across 23 data screens in our ERP. Maybe that's what we ought to work on instead of trying to uh, uh, make it faster, better, cheaper uh, around all that. And I can give you a good trade off there, but it was uh, it was certainly leading to that. Anyway, wonderful question. And I think I uh, hit that one out of the park. So thanks for asking a good question on that. I love it. And that does leave us time, I think, to slip in just even one more. So. Um, Oh, I love this one because I know right off the top of my head uh, of a book, what book resources would you recommend about data strategy? So, and of course, I'm going to tout it for you, Peter, your own book on data uh, strategy. <laughs> I, I should never say my book, uh, my, my colleague and co-author Todd and I have been three books together on this and really enjoying the process. Uh, of, of going through all of this, but uh, that's a start, but there's some other books out there. And if you haven't actually seen Sun Tzu, uh, I would absolutely recommend that as well, because that is the essence of the strategy by itself, uh, regardless of data, IT or otherwise. Sorry, I went to the wrong slide there, because uh, I know we're getting ready to to clean back up. By the way, I didn't answer the last question. I forgot that that piece. But they are asking, you know, is it a week or is it a year? Uh, and the answer is somewhere in between. But it is nice that you have oftentimes an opportunity to align it with budget cycles in some sense. So let's just say that you have five of you in your IT, excuse me, in your uh, data group, and you're each being paid 100,000. And so you cost the organization 500,000 a year. So probably you ought to find some way of demonstrating at least 500,000 in value annually. I would work backwards from that 
And you'll find it's actually not hard at all to do. I have had some very successful groups and that is the focus, gosh, Channel, we just leading right back into this again of the next book that Todd and I are working on, which will be sort of a monetizing version too. There's so many of these good stories out there. Uh, we want to try and share them with you. And actually, if you've got one you'd like to contribute, reach out to us as well. But that's going to be our focus because so many of you have done some really clever things uh, to get us there. Perfect. Well, Peter, thank you so much for kicking off the year, our 12th year, with such a great topic. Really appreciate it. Thanks to all of our attendees and community for being so engaged and just other great questions and patience as always. Really appreciate it. Um, and again, so uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, anything else in me an email if you don't receive it by in your inbox by the time you get to your desk on Friday morning. Peter, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. And Shannon, thank you for 12 years of really fun doing this, but I think also valuable. It's, it's very nice to meet you all when I go out to attend Shannon's events and things, and you all walk up and say, hey, I found your, your webinars useful, because all I see is a blank screen, and I talk to Shannon. Uh, <laughs> on this, but, uh, yeah, we do have a great community, so thank you all for sticking with us for this. Amazing. Peter, and thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, everybody.